Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about Loki Season 2. First off, I had fun with the show. I think he's a great actor, Tom Hiddleston. The cast around him is pretty good. It's a fun show, especially when you're looking at it from the point of view of a villain. Even if it's one of those villains who has, you know, Lots of complications and nuances to his character, and he plays it great. So as a whole, I think it's, I don't know what phase, I guess it's like phase four, phase five, in the scheme of Marvel. And every thumbnail highlight, which I guess you get more views from, since I know I did one by accident. And you see the death of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the... Uh, death of the TV universe, like the whole connective tissue, it's over, especially with the Madam Web movie, which I am going to watch, and again, I try to be honest with the perception of what someone's trying to push, or, you know, I'm here talking about Loki season two, will I say it's a good show, was it made well, and do I like it, and there's two, there's, those are two different things for me. I really enjoyed the show. However, the nitpick I'll have is episode three. And for some reason, it made me almost regret watching it. I try to be aware of, um, you know, my mindset. And I went into it feeling great going, you know, gung ho watching Loki season two. I loved season one. I liked where it all came together. It was a little complicated, especially this one. But. As I got to season uh, episode three, my mind almost shut down. Like I don't want to see this. I don't. I, you know, we got characters they're talking about that you don't remember from season one, type thing, and you're blending in period pieces because of time travel, and you've got the actor who plays Kang, just hamming it up as some. You know, uh, 1800s, 1900s, or whatever, you know, scientists. It just felt fucking wrong. And I don't really have much to say about the, um, the actor. I heard a little bit about controversy, and that's just um, surface stuff. Uh, so I'm going to be honest. I don't know what allegations were. I don't know if there's a really, you know... If it's one of those, oh, let's, you know, string this guy out. If it was something stupid, I don't know anything. But I wasn't impressed with see episode three, and it kind of almost threw me off. I was surprised. Uh, but it's one little hiccup for me, and looking at it from a lot of people, I don't think they care. Or, you know, I just don't think it was um, a big, uh, big enough deal for the general audience or people who are watching However, Loki, and I said this about WandaVision, WandaVision's first three episodes were the fucking biggest gamble ever. You nearly turned off every fan, like even people from the outside, you don't know what the fuck is going on. Loki, season one, and season two especially, can get out of hand. It feels like it's spiraling out of control, and I think that's part of the show. It's Really, what they're looking at when you're talking about where the season takes place, what's going on, what's the theme. So it ends with season one, where they, you know, the TVA, the Time Variance Authority, their location, their base of operations and monitoring and pruning the timelines, which I thought was a great idea, especially when you're obviously going to start bringing in, I think, incursions or... You know, if they're going to go with their Secret War movie plans, whatever that might be, this feels like everything is just getting ready to, to, you're pulling the last threads, and it's done well, it's part of the show, it's part of the theme, but I'm going to say a little ballsy, you got a real split audience, in my opinion, just from what I could think of being a comic book fan of, wanting Loki to be a villain, he's evil. And you balance that by having other counterparts of him, bringing back Sylvie, you know, a variant of his. And 
he's such a good actor. He's so good at the role. And when he's wearing a suit, I don't know if they're going to ever, I think they have. I've probably seen that thumbnail. That they're going to try to get Hiddleston one day for James Bond. Go for it. You know, I don't, uh, it's not really um, foremost in my mind, but seeing him in the suit and doing all the, you know, tuxedo things. But the show is risky. It really takes a chance on alienating its audience in a way because it's so, it's so all over the place. And again, you're talking about at the end of the first movie, meeting the He Who Remains, which is Kang, and him explaining, oh no, you need this place. And without it, the all versions of me will come and it'll be whatever. Now, I don't know if that version of the story was changed because of what happened with the actor and them dissing themselves from him but maybe that has to do with more the chaotic feeling the um the episode three problem i had and where it was kind of going because i think in my mind i think in my mind i was thinking there was going to be lots of kangs we were going to see different iterations of him uh and you know the the split the variant versions would be the highlight of the show where you know you never knew what kang was coming and but they went away from that it seems now this could have been part of the plan but as they build loki up in his fucking team he's getting together i had fun with it but i gotta recognize risky you taking a gamble again like i think they did with WandaVision, which I loved, especially the way it came together. Now, there are flaws here and there, but there's so much here that I think more people will really like it. I think there's going to be a good response to this. I don't know in how it's fitting in now. Like I said, if you were going to make Kang part of your interim leading up to whatever it is, Phase 5, 6, Secret Wars, whatever your ultimate plan was, I think it's changed, and that could be just for me just getting an idea, of the, because I try not to watch things and get too deep until after I've done my review, so I'll probably will find out what this guy, uh, Jonathan Majors, um, he's playing Victor Timely, like an old-time 1893 type uh, inventor, and He Who Remains, and Kang the Conqueror, there's... A lot of um, touches and connections to the first season and what Sylvie did and spoilers or whatever. Uh, Loki and Sylvie find Kang at the end of time and his whatever time variance authority. And the dilemma is Loki realize, or Loki un- thinks he understands that without the TVA, without Kang leading everything, Everything will go to shit. You take Kang out of the equation, the timelines don't get pruned, it creates chaos, it just becomes a madhouse. And it kind of hints that just on its own, everything gets fucked up. Like, if this device wasn't here, and they talk about the loom, and would it inevitably become unruly and crazy? I think that's part of it, but the part that they push are... The parts that they push are, it's not really that timelines will go crazy and there'll be time slips and all the temporal anomalies. It's the fact that Kang will come in all variants. And there'll be war, constant war for timelines and universal domination type thing. And that's where the real threat is. Again, I think that's lost in this show because of what happened with the actor. So... It feels like they started inputting, you know, what they Because it, it feels a natural progression to switch it from Kang to Loki. So you've got this dilemma, this um, issue, this major thing between Loki and Sylvie, his, his variant, that Loki realizes or thinks you can't kill Kang. So Sylvie has to. She believes she, you have to. And she kills him and frees the timeline. Meaning not restricted and they're not auto pruned by some fucking cosmic device. And everything's supposed to be okay. Boom. You're good. But as Loki season two starts, 
Loki feels the ramifications of this as he's uh, time slipping, they're calling it, jumping between times within the TVA. And I, I missed it at first. It's, I think, maybe important, but you're not supposed to be able to time slip or travel that way within the TVA base of operations. So that starts to come into this. And, you know, I got to say, they did a great job uh, getting, uh, uh, I don't want to fuck the actor's name up, Ki Hu Kwan. And just great seeing him in this movie. He's the kid, well, he was a kid who played um, Short Round in Indiana Jones, The Goonies. Seeing him in this show. And it, this is what I think nostalgia does, because it's an actual psychological thing. And I'll be honest with my connection to it. When I saw him on the Loki Season 2 show, and when he started talking and doing his thing as an actor, I wasn't immediately aware of who he was. But looking back, I will definitely say I'm almost positive that I felt an immediate love and connection with the character. And I think that's how nostalgia works. You know, you're realizing this is, you know, short round, and it's uh, from the kid from the Goonies who makes him all the uh, devices and the inventions. You could have had this being that character. It is a joy. It's a way where comic book writers, movie makers, just know when it works in that way. I just... Well, I guess it's a gamble in any sense, but good on this guy, ki Hu Kwan. He's just got some notoriety for a movie he did, I believe, with, um, oh, man. I, what was the fucking movie? I don't know. It had a lot to do with, um, you know, out of body or having different bodies. Damn it. Kurt, Jamie Lee Curtis was in it. Uh, anyway. Seeing him in here, realizing it was short round, uh, and the kid from the Goonies, I really was so, I was so, you know, felt warm feelings, and I was so happy to keep seeing him on the show, and I think the last time I felt that way was watching the Flash TV show, yeah, I know, it went to shit, but it, I think it was seeing uh, the actor who played his father was the original Flash. I and mean, it's not as connected as this because I was almost a child when I watched The Goonies. And um, I guess I was a fucking kid, right? I don't know. I'm, four, I'm 13 when Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom comes out. And I'm like 14 when The Goonies came out. Anyway, seeing him in here, good on him. Kihu Kwan, fucking awesome. I can't tell you how good it made me feel. Warm feelings, you feel safe, you, you know, you're immediately connected. And for me, it worked on the show and on a level that I'm trying to be honest about where it really grounded me and pulled me in. And I guess it's just, where, where has he been? You know, you, you want a guy like this to get all the accolades he can get, so good on him. Again, Owen Wilson, playing mean, Mobius, it all feels good. It feels like it connects. And I think my only hiccup is that episode three. I mean, the way it's shot, it's innovative things they do. There's some callbacks to regular. Like, whenever you hear someone talk about a black hole, I think um, OB mentions, I think, the, see, now I'm going to get fucked up. Kihu Kwan plays Ouroboros, and they call him OB. Um, it's just, it's just, to me, it just, captivated me uh he's a linchpin in this as well as some of the other characters who come back and it again episode three is the hiccup the things they did is just amazing the sound it just all works but one of the things they talk about is like uh obi when you talk about black hole is you know when he say he turned to spaghetti and that's how they made the time unraveling look. And I thought it was fucking hilarious. And I thought it matched. Because you could do something spectacular. You know, um, particle disperse and 
all the shit. No, they went. Everybody gets you know liquefied into the like, colorful strands of like spaghetti. And this is when the time effects are fucking everything up because of the loom and the device. Because that's the plot of this season is when this episode when when it starts. Um, Sylvie just found a world to go live a normal life because that's all she wanted to do. But Loki's stuck in this time slip event and it's fucking everything up in the time variance authority building. And the whole season is we have a device that was created by, I guess, Kang the Conqueror with this organization he created to prune the timelines. And again, the debate is no, people should, it should be free universes and whatever. There should be no governing of it. And maybe there's this missing dilemma where if everything was free from the beginning, what would be the problem? There'd be multiple, there'd be more branching of timelines where, you know, I made a left here, I made a right here. Those are two different uh, realities because I made a different decision, possibilities, that type thing. Um, but it's Kang coming in different forms. And I think there it missed the ball because... We didn't get to see, they should, they should have showed variations of whenever they went to the future of the Time Variance Authority, in the distance should have been like, you know, you could do a CG in the background, like 50 different Kangs fighting over everything. So as much as I love the show, the two things I think um, might have given me pause was episode three. It just jarred me out. I didn't want to see it go in that direction, and it didn't keep going. It's ugh. Everybody has their their style. In the end, this is great. The directors, and you know, got to give them some credit here. I really liked what they did. They could have you could have really underplayed a lot of these things where. You just played it safe, and you made your season two. This is, in my in my opinion, a little ballsy, a little risky. And that comes with some minor, you know, things that happen. I'm sure there are people doing more in depth things who can really, you know, break down, you know, the three act structure and say, okay, well, you know, I know it's not a movie, but this is a season two. Does it accomplish what a season two needs to accomplish? I think it did, but I will not. You know, I will not you know argue with somebody who finds these elements that I saw littered throughout, but not in abundance that are going to make you regret. You know, by episode four, are you like rolling your eyes because that's where I was almost in this. But it's six episodes again. Marvel seems to know for the most part what they're doing with what needs seven episodes, what needs to be an hour, you know, that type thing. And Disney, Star Wars just don't know what the fuck they're doing because someone's made the decision where Mandarin's got to be 32 minutes of comic book action and it can't breathe and can't set things up. But let's do um, Andor, you know, critically written and critically claimed 12 episodes an hour each. So on that, I really enjoyed Loki season two. I like some of the elements they put in there. Again, two detriments are it gets unruly and out of control really fast. But, again, I'll connect that to saying it's part of its charm. I don't think this is something you can watch, though, without understanding something about the Marvel Cinematic Universe and all their connections. And this is a fucking achievement. So, yeah, call me a Marvel fanboy. DC dropped the ball on most aspects but i still love fucking dc comics and want to see a great fucking universe but all this poo poo you see on fucking line all the thumbnails to get clickbait really amounts to nothing because i don't think this has been seen before when can we look back and maybe the days where um movie production companies had solid contracts for years with a certain actor and a certain theme movie. You know, how many movies are there for Godzilla? And James Bond. Um, I know it's not exactly the same allegory, but... When can you see a structure of... Story. Connective plots and twists. 
the actors and actresses who carry on and show up and do different things has never been done like this, in my opinion. It's not with the quality. Yes, there are some things that are better than others. Maybe you can convince me one or two things are outright garbage, and maybe I have bad taste and I liked it anyway. I'm not sure. I'm not, you know, we're just talking bullshit. However, Marvel is on a super success. I don't care all these thumbnails. I know there's a business aspect to this. I know there's a, you know, a deadlines and gross net profit and all that stuff does come into account. I get it. But this feels like someone is really trying to make this a fucking 20 year fucking story and I can't remember it ever being done. It is a monumental achievement, especially when you come into Loki season two. And the magic is still there. Yes. Uh, can I say season one might be better than season two? Could I debate with somebody and say, you know what? You're right. <clears throat> Loki season two is not a good season. It's not a good show. But fuck did I love it. You know, did I get carried away? Did I smile? Did I fall in love with seeing fucking short round? What is it called? Data, I think. And um, uh, the Goonies. Did seeing him every time make me feel great, warm, fuzzy, nostalgia, and happy that this guy is back in the, and he took a hiatus from acting, whatever the fuck it is. It works. And then Sylvie, like, oh, I had, I like this character. I had an attachment. And the ending, building up to the ending, I knew it was coming. I could feel it because of what they weren't doing with Kang. And again, I will do a deeper dive. I don't want to sit here and give. Make like I'm giving the guy a break. Because maybe he did something really bad. And I, you know, it just feels weird. Especially when, you know, there is something to say that there's too much, you know, woke this, woke that. So I'll give it that. I'll, you know, I just don't want to make a decision. But I don't want to sit here and say, you know, the man's a great man. Because I don't even think he pulled it off for the most part in this show, in this season. Because as much as I liked him in most things, it felt like his role was changed and cut. I was totally expecting to see from from, from all for the episodes leading up to six, tidbits of CGI, whatever, armies of Kangs flying in his green, purple fucking Iron Man type suits. And just laying havoc. Or even showing it on the timelines like cameras and stuff and say, look, Earth 4 or 5, whatever the fuck. Kangs, there's a Kang, there's a Kang there. Oh no, there's a... They didn't do that, and it, it became evident in my mind where they were going with this with Loki. But again, if this is a cleanup, um, you know, is, is if this is a someone trying to make do what they got because they had to change plans, give them an award, in my opinion. This is, um, you know... Okay, so apparently he was, um, I see, I don't know about doing this. I don't want to make this a fucking political bullshit, but he was, uh, he went to trial for misdemeanor assault and harassment charges. Um, okay, so he was, um, Convicted of assault, uh, harassment, and he has other allegations. All right, fine. Whatever. So I dealt with that. I just think that his role has changed drastically. It doesn't... It, cause, again, could someone convince me that the structure of this is not very well done? It's haphazard, and it just happens to, in my mind, lend to this time is unraveling type thing. Sure, but I think there's also something to say that it helps with what you're doing. But again, you're almost on the cusp of an unruly, out-of-control show. Because again, what I'm thinking in my head, even now, what were the stakes here? If, if Sophie freed the universes, meaning there's no more pruning, auto-pruning from some company, some AI, some, you know, you know entity... 
or whatever that decides that these universes don't can't spawn out of control. It can have branching, connective, parallel universes. Let's have a machine that prunes everything. When she, when it's freed, if it was freed from the beginning, it would just be a constant. Because here in the in the show, the main thing is the temporal loom. It's con it's got to be fixed and it's got to be upgraded to handle all the new branching timelines because they're just multiplying. But when you think of it from Sophie's point of view, who's just on an earth where she wants to fucking serve burgers at McDonald's, it, it, it's, it's a success. It's, hey, you know, there aren't worlds getting fucking fleeced. And again, the underlying currents of season one is everybody who works at the Time Variance Authority didn't get up on a certain earth and get, you know, a, or take a job offering. No, they were kidnapped from Variant pruned earth some of them most of them i guess and they were mind wiped and they all work at this organization which is to keep the timelines in check and really it's because you want to keep he who remains a variance of kang away from this multiverse so there is a great real dilemma here where yes kang has to die and you can't just kill universes and potential to, but it's working for this and we got to keep it intact. And I think they handled that great. A couple of mishaps here and there and you're getting towards the end of the show and you're fucking all over the place. There's like shit going on. Great cinematography, great effects they're doing. You know, uh, very used tropes and stuff, but when you can use them well, that's why they're tropes and that's why they work. Things that, you know, make a plot go, time travel, did I, you know, the counterparts. You know, why did I disintegrate and get killed? Oh, this will make sense now. That type of thing. And it has its charm. Again, Tom Hiddleston, just a great actor in that sense of um, nailing this role and knowing what the audience wants. I think there's a. There's something to say about a balance between a director and an actor and how much power and weight they bring and authority and claim. So, for instance, if Loki comes into season two and says, this is the way I want this character to go, I'm guessing it, it would be done. He's already Loki. He's cemented in Loki. Although Marvel already has an out because you can make him the frog. You can make him the, all the variants you showed of him. But it feels like they're on the same plane. Tom Hiddleston wants to do it this way, and so did the directors. It works for the show. The, the cast, um, having the guys come back here and there and recognizing, oh, who's this chick from the first movie? This fucking AI that's with her? Miss Minutes, and again, that's where episode three just fucking, it, it almost made me upset. And maybe it's, it, they carried, they carried um, Kang's variant, Pride guy throughout the fucking season, and even when they killed him like 90 fucking times, <laughs> and um, because they have this thing, is another thing they do where they um got to get the loom working, so they make a device to uh, to refit it, and they decide to make the Kang variant, <clears throat> the inventor guy, get in his big, bulky fucking suit that was his name he did earlier, Loki. But he's got to walk out to this plank, put the device in, set it up, and he dies, and they fail. But <clears throat> Loki's controlling his time slipping now. So he keeps going back, redoing it, redoing it, make it faster, make it fast. And it's just, it works. So it's, it wasn't just that the actor is there and there's something in the back of my mind that says, oh, I shouldn't like him, or the guy who's playing Jonathan, whatever the fuck his name is, and he's playing Kang, and I'm not supposed to like him, I shouldn't be happy, or, you know, applaud his effort here or there, Jonathan Majors, but after episode three, I was okay with that. Just maybe my brain wasn't in the mood to, you know, stay trapped in an 1800 setting trying to make these tropes work and this fucking new idiot guy, villain, minion, Loki. No, not Loki. Um, you know, trying to fuck up everything, working for different factions within the TVA because it's like two or three and one wants to help, one wants to see things through. Stay on course. And is it worth fighting for? And they, that weight is distributed unevenly. 
But when you have good writing and, you know, you know you're with Loki and his team most of the time, I think the writing is superb in that aspect. Of course you can't stay with the uh, antagonists or these certain factions and write out season one and two from that perspective. But with enough, with enough good writing and good visuals, you can tell that. And it's also that difference between, like, if I'm writing a book and a um, novel, you know, my characters, and I'm writing a, a script or a, a movie thing, there's a big difference between what you have to do in a book to show and tell, that show and tell type thing, and what is narrated, and what you're putting on the script for, uh, just to get it on the page to set everything up, and a director goes in with the actor. I think this is a fucking, almost a miracle like I said, I'm not going to be surprised if people are a little taken back by this season, where it goes, how it tries to affect everything, and where it fucking ends up. Because, spoiler alert, if I'm correct, Loki is the god of time. There's almost no other way he turns to the camera and says, I know what type of god I want to be. Without his suit, he walks onto the... Because remember, he's... Alright, if we're going to go with the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Marvel blah 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 blah, Asgardians are very powerful aliens, I'm doing the fucking quote quotes, that are perceived as gods and worshipped as gods over the millennia, and their magic is technology, that type thing that we don't understand. Fine. You know, they're not saying these are the true... I mean, they are saying it's the true myth of Odin and where they come from, but they're really just powerful aliens, that type of thing. Anyway. And now, that might not be true in the Marvel Cinematic Universe either, but taking from what I know from comics, let's just assume that is. Loki, in his travels and his dilemma, because they do use shitty characters and whatever, you know, characters you're supposed to hate, to bring out. You know, that's one of the you know tips about writing. You know, you can make you can write your villains to make your heroes look more like heroes. You don't have to keep declaring your heroes so good at something. You know, and, and in that case, um, Loki's uh, exposed basically. You know, he's doing things, and he's always set off to make sure he comes out in the end ahead. In it shows what a good actor he is, too, because when the villain-type lackey guy is being interrogated by him, and he's like, oh, blah, 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 Loki, you this or that, you know, you, you've done terrible things. He goes, you know what? I have done terrible, awful things. And there's that hint of menace. And even when the, the closing shot of the fucking season concerning Loki is... Did he get what he wanted the whole time? Has this always been his game? Or has he changed and taken on the mantle of this time god to make sure things are better? I think they did that great, and I think they put a stamp on he did change and he's doing something for the better. And they even call out Thor... Um, because the first Thor movie is one of my favorites. And yes, it has its faults and whatever. It might not be... Lit but it, it shows the heart of what could have been and what actors are willing to do. Right? Because look at the first Thor movie. Oh, Odin is fucking pissed at Thor. Thor is an arrogant fucking chode. He's a fucking asshole. And he comes to Earth and he changes. Now... By the fourth fucking Thor, he's a goofball, fucking bumbling ass clown type thing. And even though this movie's a fun, but even he, the actor, has said, you know, where they were going with the character. He's when you're versatile and you're such a good actor and you want to feed the audience comic book fun. I get it. But Loki's talking to the character. He's like, you know, my brother was sent to Earth and he came back changed. And it is so prominent in that movie, especially when Thor's trying to grab his hammer and, you know, Odin has uh, made him unworthy, so to speak. It works for Loki. And it's, I can't, 
it's so fucking refreshing to see an obvious villain. And even in the first Avengers movie, his first appearances, he did have a comical trickster side of him that he was that was displayed great. But he wanted to rule the Earth. And in this show, he admits it wasn't well thought out. And he went, he went, he got unhinged. Even if you're saying things that go against what the movie's message was, it's a great way, and they do it good, to show his thought patterns about it in any case. Because you could be lying, you know, I'm not going to go with psychology on a fucking Asgardian, but I'm sure we have human behaviors, you know, this is life. And then, again, closing this uh, uh, this Loki chapter out with him grabbing the threads of time and walking through this realm, pulling them to him, sitting on the throne, and I guess keeping them organized. And it's such a, a world tree moment when you know Norse history. And um, Now, the message that he got in here might be a little muddled because it's one of those where a villain says something, and it makes you go, oh, wait, yeah. So Loki in his dilemma is like, I can't kill Sophie and stop Kang from dying because it, whatever, it's right. She's right. But what can I do? And there's a, I wish it was done more, but there's a great, you know, collision and confrontation between Loki and uh, Kang where they even stop time and talk. Like, okay. How many times have you done this? Are we going to do this a thousand more times? You keep trying to stop her from killing me. If she succeeds anyway. I mean, this is all... You know, part of the day. Part of the thing for Kang. But Loki comes to the realization because of something Kang says. And when they're trying to get the device outfitted to get the loom working properly. Because it should have worked. And they go into infinite expansions of universes. Loki's like, oh my god, what the fuck? What the fuck? And he realizes he's gonna he's an Asgardian god. In the sense that he realizes, but his machinations, his plans, his ego, all that stuff had to be beaten down and tempered into this new Loki who goes, Alright, I'm gonna walk out there with no suit, pull these fucking timelines, use my god power, and become the new loom or whatever. Excellent. I'm fucking happy. I watched this again with a couple of hiccups here and there. There's, um, there seems to be, you know, just some aspects of what could have went wrong, what was going wrong with actors, uh, course correcting throughout the show. Cause you know, you have to gear towards where you were going with Kang's coming in and maybe they were doing Kang movies. If they recovered from that type of stuff, good on them. Loki season two is again an achievement for me because i'm just thinking about it now and you know when i prepare for these things like fuck the haters and all the bullshit yes none of not every movie is a fucking masterpiece but this is an achievement that really hit home for me when see when loki sits on the throne at the end of season two and he's quote you know for better or lack of better it's the god of time my brain just went, holy shit. We can, I'll go back to the Blade movie, to the X-Men movie. And those are actually X-Men, those are Marvel movies that, because of Deadpool 3, which is going to be fucking insane, are going to always be a part of the Marvel Universe. That is genius. That is bringing everything in. You're bringing that story. You can get new actors. You can do all the new shit. But it's always been there. And you're weaving it in. You've got 20 years of fucking a story being told. I don't think they get enough credit. Yes, maybe they're making the billions and that's where it's due. But I'm going to give some credit to these people who are sitting there. Make a movie like Ant-Man. Fun fucking movie which blew my mind. And yeah, you shit the bed on the second one. He did this with Wonder Woman too. I loved the Wonder Woman movie, but the second movie was garbage. It was fun as I was, you know, as much fun as I had with it. Loki season two really was fun for me. Had a little bit of a hiccup here and there, but 
for some reason it just cemented what an achievement it is. Okay, if you don't like half the things, maybe you're a Marvel hater in a sense, you have a bias and fine, DC's better, it's smaller, more adult. Great, yeah, the Snyderverse is amazing for you. I get it. But when you're looking at it from even that point of view, can't you look over and say, holy shit, you know, I love my stuff too, but I don't know. There is a legitimate complaint about the formula of these movies, the comedy, all the stuff. But yet, it's fucking working, and that has to be respected. This achievement of a 20-year storyline. Got everybody, Captain America, Tony Stark, the Hulk. Every, every connected tissue seems to be thought out, at least given some fucking weight. And given some effort to make it feel like I'm living in a real universe. And we have, in my opinion. And then... That's a fucking achievement. So bravo to Marvel. And Loki season two is not the achievement of, you know, renown, but it's just fucking really good in my opinion. I love it because of, you know, what I can find from it. And I will find, definitely say season episode three really fucking, it nearly threw me off this whole show. But okay, get, give me the stuttering fucking inventor guy and some time thing. You know, I'm okay with it, but. It's a, it's an achievement as a whole. Marvel Cinematic, the TV universe. Bring me more. I'm fucking excited to watch Madam Web. I don't give a fuck what the budget is. I don't give a fuck what movie it was supposed to be. Was it supposed to be a TV show that they made into a movie? Are they making a movie? I don't care. I watch fucking Mobius. And I found enjoyment in that movie. And my, uh, my framing of that movie was, this was a shit fucking fest. That someone with some love and talent put effort in and made a decent movie, in my opinion. So I even like Mobius. Do these connective things, build on it, and I think people who even haters are going to have to recognize the fucking monumental achievement that's been made, and it's really hitting home with me, and I think it's short round. Fucking fuck. Data short round. When I watched this and saw him in it, I, I gotta say, I was in, I fell in love with the fucking show and never lost it. So, there you go. Put him in everything. Loki Season 2. I recommend it. It is fucking unruly. It can get, at, it can get crazy, that's for sure. If you don't know anything, it could be um, crazy to follow. So, watch Season 1 at least. Have an understanding. Fine. He's so good, though, and the writing's decent enough, and the way they connect things, that I think it's working for everybody, so I hope everybody had as much fun as I did. What an achievement in general. Oh, Loki Season 2. All right, everybody. Be well, and I'll talk to you all soon.